Hi, in this lecture, we're going to start our study of the heart, which is chapter 17. And what we're going to look at here is an overview of the heart, where it's located, some of the coverings of the heart. We will look at the superficial anatomy of the heart, the chambers and the main vessels, and then we'll go through the blood flow through the heart. When we look at the cardiovascular system, we are going to be looking at the blood, which we've already done. The blood is the transporter, right? That's the connective tissue, that's the fluid that's transporting things throughout the body. The blood vessels are the pipes or the conduits. Now, arteries are called arteries because they always transport blood away from the heart. And so they're carrying it away, where a vein is always carrying blood back to the heart. The capillaries are the smallest vessels. They are the exchange vessels. They're going to exchange nutrients and gases with your cells. Now, a lot of times anatomy students want to just memorize that arteries are red and always carry O2 rich blood. And they always want to say veins are blue on the models because they always carry O2 poor blood. Well, that statement isn't 100% correct. First of all, when you look at any anatomical model, they're nice, they color them for us. Anything red means it's carrying O2 rich blood. It doesn't always mean it's an artery. Anything blue is always carrying O2 poor blood. Now you can say that arteries usually carry O2 rich blood, and you can say that veins usually transport O2 poor blood, but there's a couple special cases here, and one you're going to see next. When we look at the cardiovascular system, the heart's the pump. The heart has to contract, right? It has to generate pressure to force and propel that blood through your pipes. There's two circuits that it pumps through at the exact same time. There's a pulmonary circuit, which is when blood goes from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart. Well, I'm sure you know about this circuit, right? Because we inhale and bring O2 rich air in, right? Oxygen in, and that enters our blood and we exhale, and when we exhale, we're trying to eliminate the CO2 out of our blood. And if you look at this picture, you're going to notice blue and red. Now remember, red means O2 rich, and blue means O2 poor. So if we look at the pulmonary circuit here, notice that the vessels carrying blood away from the heart, so carrying blood away from the heart going to the lungs, are blue. Those are your pulmonary arteries. So the pulmonary arteries are usually blue. Sometimes they color them a little purple on the models because they're carrying O2 poor blood. They're arteries because they're transporting blood away from the heart. Whereas if we look at the veins now, get a different color here, we have veins bringing blood back to the heart from the lungs because once we get that O2 rich blood, we bring it back. And notice that the pulmonary veins are carrying the O2 rich blood. So in our pulmonary circuit, it's a little opposite what you would think. Now systemic is probably what you think of when you think of arteries, femoral artery, brachial artery, right? So your systemic goes to all cells of the body. And in the systemic circuit, that's when we're going to have our red and blue. And in our systemic, our arteries are red and they carry O2 rich blood away from the heart. And our veins are going to be blue on the models because they're carrying O2 poor blood back to the heart so it can pump it over to the lungs. So exactly where does your heart lie? Well, it sits behind your sternum, right? In your pericardial cavity, so it has its own cavity. And remember, it's inside that smaller cavity called, you call it the mediastinum or mediastinum. It sits a little bit to the left and you could kind of palpate. You can come up and palpate your clavicle and drop down and feel your first rib. So you can count and when you slide your fingers, I don't know if you can see this, when you slide your fingers down your ribs, they naturally go in at these intercostal spaces. So you can count down and palpate, find your second rib and then your finger will slip in in those spaces. And it goes to about the fifth intercostal space and it's roughly the size of your fist. Um, I wanted to jump back really quick to this for a moment because I just glanced at my notes and saw I have the word aorta on your handout. So what you should recognize is that the aorta is the largest systemic artery. It's a big artery that takes blood off of the heart and we'll look more at that shortly. Now when we look at the heart, there's something called the apex, put my head over here. 
<laughs> and the apex is the pointy part. Notice the apex points down, so it's anterior and inferior, and the base is the flat part on the back of the heart. So a lot of times I say in lab, if you put the heart model down on the table, it usually ends up sitting on the base. So the, pa the, the base is posterior, and a lot of it contains the left atrium. So you see the left atrium better on the posterior side of the heart. If we were to do a section, right, a cross section, transverse cut right across, I wanted you to see for a moment, you can see obviously your lungs, but then this right here is the esophagus. And I just wanted to jump to something called GERD, or gastro, gas, gastroesophageal reflux disease, really challenging for me to say today. And so I know you've heard of it. Your stomach has hydrochloric acid and there's some sphincters and sometimes that acid starts to come up into the esophagus and it burns. That's why it's called heartburn. And notice again, the esophagus is directly posterior to the heart. So, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes heartburn feels like chest pain. And so you might have heartburn and think you're having a heart attack or be dealing with a patient with that or your patient might actually be having a heart attack and dismiss it as heartburn. Now, when we look at the actual heart, so we're gonna take the sternum off and the ribs off, and we look at where it's located, notice that, again, we said it was inside the pericardial cavity, but it's surrounded by a sac called the pericardium. So if you were going to dissect and get into the heart to do surgery, you have to cut through this sac. You have to slice open the pericardium. So the pericardium or pericardial sac, it's a double layer sac. It has two layers and it surrounds and stabilizes the heart. Now the outer layer is called the fibrous pericardium. That's what you would see first. It's more superficial and you can see how it kind of anchors the heart to the diaphragm and helps hold it in place. Whereas if we look inside, so we slice this now, we open up the pericardium, the inside is called the serous pericardium or the serous layer. And you've learned these layers before in a &P one because the serous layer has two layers to it. It's going to have a um, parietal layer and it's going to have a visceral layer. So I'll go ahead and write on this here. So we are going to have our parietal pericardium. I'll draw that in red. It's not drawing. There's that red part. Now the gray is the fibrous pericardium. And then if I were to do the visceral pericardium, remember visceral means it actually attaches to the organ. I'll draw it right here, kind of this yellow. So we're gonna have a visceral pericardium that attaches to the heart. In fact, it's known as the epicardium because it sticks on the heart. It actually forms the outer heart wall. Remember, visceral membranes surround and attach to the organ, whereas the parietal membrane kind of lines the cavity. And the pericardial cavity is that space in between the two. And we know that that, I'll just put white here. So that's the pericardial cavity. So we have our outer, our parietal. We have our inner, which is our visceral, and the space in between is the cavity. Now that space contains fluid, and that fluid is called pericardial fluid. So looking at some pictures here, you can see over here, a little clearer, that fibrous layer, the dark red. Now I have my serous, which has the two membranes. My serous pericardium has a parietal, which is right out here next to the fibrous. Parietal lines the pericardial cavity. I have a space, which is the cavity, and then I have the visceral that attaches to the heart. And since it's attached to the heart, the visceral pericardium is known as the epicardium. In fact, as we study these organs, you'll be seeing that that visceral membrane usually becomes part of the organ. Now, if we look at this, we have the fluid inside, and the fluid is called pericardial fluid. And there's a small amount of fluid there because, you know, the heart's moving and it's beating. So that fluid is there to help lubricate and allow the heart to move. So two terms to define, pericarditis. Remember, itis means inflammation of. So an inflammation of your pericardium is pericarditis. It could be viral bacteria. Obviously, you want to treat it because you don't want to get into the actual heart. In fact, if you hear endocarditis, now it's inside the lining of your heart. Now, cardiac tamponon is a condition, it's a life-threatening condition, where there's too much pericardial fluid. So it's usually due to some sort of injury. Maybe you're in a car accident and your chest hits the steering wheel. And so you can have blood or too much pericardial fluid, and so that accumulates. Now, the heart needs to move. Well, imagine if I have fluid around it, 
it's not going to let it move. And if it can't move, it can't contract and it can't pump blood. So this is life threatening. And often a needle has to be put in to suck out that extra fluid and leave room for that heart to beat. So if we look at the actual heart wall now, we know we have, there's what we just saw with our pericardium and we had our outer, we have our serous and our, our membranes here. We have parietal and visceral. So remember that the wall, the wall of the heart itself is called the epicardium, which is the visceral pericardium. Now look at the thickest part. The thickest layer of the heart is the myocardium. And you probably know myo means muscle. So this is cardiac muscle. Um, myocytes, right? Muscle cells. So we'll be looking more at that um, in the next lecture. And the lining of the heart, if you look at this tissue, it's C, you might recognize that as simple squamous epithelial. The lining of the heart forms what's called the endocardium within. And sometimes we just call it the endothelium because it's a layer of simple squamous cells. Now, this endothelium is continuous. It's one sheet. It forms the valves and it goes all the way out of the heart and forms the lining of all the blood vessels. So it's all attached. So let's jump to our anatomy of the heart. You've probably heard of atria and ventricles. And if we look, we know the atria, there's two of these, two atria, two ventricles. They're simply called right and left. Now, just note that if we're talking about one chamber, we say atrium, notice the ending, where if it's plural, we say atria. Let's get the right color marker here. Okay, so you see atrium. Now, they have what's called an oracle, which you might think of means ear. It's actually a little flap of muscle, and it just kind of hangs over. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, and it just kind of can expand and hold a little more blood. So we have our right and left atria, and we have our right and left ventricles. Atria are smaller and superior. Now, between them is a little hole, which actually in an adult heart, you'll see a little divot on the heart model. It's not a hole anymore. In fact, it's only an opening in a um, basically a, a fetus and a newborn. So it's we have what's called the fossa ovalis. In an adult heart, we call it fossa ovalis, and you'll see it. It is the remnants of a shunt. So in a fetus, it's called the foramen ovale. And so it is a literal hole between the two chambers of the heart, and it's a shunt. So what's a shunt? A shunt is a bypass. So if you are a fetus, then you are inside mom and you are not breathing, right? So you are getting your oxygen from mom and she's taking away your waste. And so what happens in the fetal heart is when the blood comes into the right atrium, it gets shunted directly to the, the, left, the left atrium um, because that way it will bypass the lungs because you're going to see shortly that blood would go from the right atrium to the right ventricle and out that pulmonary vessel to the lungs. But the baby, the fetus isn't breathing, so we don't send it to the lungs. So it's a shunt and about two thirds of all that blood that's coming in is going to get shunted to the left side of the heart and then it will simply go out the left side of the heart and it'll bypass the lungs. So after the baby is born, that flap will actually close. There'll be a pressure change in the heart that we'll talk about later. And when it closes, we call it the fossa ovalis. So on our heart models, we label it fossa ovalis, but just know it used to be something called the foramen ovale or foramen oval, which was a shunt in the fetus. Now, if we look at the ventricles, I said they're the two bigger chambers or inferior, we have a right, and a left, remember anatomical position. And if we look at the ventricles, there's a wall between them, a layer of myocardium called the interventricular septum. Septum means wall between the ventricles. The other thing that you're going to see in ventricles is something called trabeculae carne. So when you look inside, trabeculae might sound familiar from AMP1 when you learned about spongy bone and carne means meat. So you can kind of see, I'll have another picture coming up, not the best view here. You actually can see it in here. If you look inside, see how it looks like a network kind of like that spongy bone. So trabeculae carne are little beams, they're just like a little network, a little mesh, so to speak, um, inside the lining of the ventricles, and it just allows the ventricles to kind of expand and fill with more blood. And the other thing you see here are these things called papillary muscles. You see them up here, 
and here, and they're attached to these really tough, like rope-like structures called chordae tendinae that we'll get to when we look at the valves, but they look kind of white. And so papillary muscles are little muscles. Papilla means rounded or nipple-like projection. And they're gonna be really important for these two valves here, which you might have heard of before, something called the tricuspid and the mitral. We call these the AV valves, and they're gonna come up soon. So we say AV for the valves between the atria and the ventricles. Now, if we're looking at heart anatomy, the right side of the heart has O2 poor blood. The left side of the heart always has O2 rich blood. So your systemic circuit is sending blood back to the right side of the heart where it goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And now the right ventricle is gonna send that O2 poor blood out the pulmonary circuit. Remember I showed you, it's gonna go out the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary artery, and hold it over to the lungs so you can oxygen it. Once you oxygenate it, that O2 rich blood is gonna go back to the heart and it goes to the left side through the pulmonary circuit. Now remember, when we're looking at the pulmonary circuit, the vessel that's transporting the O2 rich blood back, do you remember what it was called? It's a pulmonary vein. Whereas remember when we're looking in the pulmonary circuit, the vessel taking blood away from the heart is the pulmonary artery because it's taking it away, to the, away from the heart to the lungs. Whereas the pulmonary veins are bringing blood back to the heart from the lungs. Then this blood goes into the left ventricle, and then it's going to leave into your systemic circuit through your aorta. Now, when you're looking at the atria and the ventricles, there's a little groove that goes around the heart. It's called a sulcus, the coronary sulcus. You might remember sulcus from the brain. And it's a small groove. It actually has coronary vessels in it, so it's kind of hard to see it on the model. You usually see the blood vessel that's kind of like right in the way of it. But that's the groove that's there to separate those. Some of the other superficial anatomy were called the great vessels. Um, in this picture, you can see the coronary sulcus. See how there's red and blue in it? Those are coronary vessels, we'll learn later, but it wraps around, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Didn't quite mean to push that. And it wraps around the heart. Now, some of these great vessels here are the superior vena cava, which is above the heart, this big blue thing above the heart. And then you have the inferior vena cava, which is this blue thing below the heart. They're the biggest, largest veins of the body. Notice we see our heart. So here's the apex. So our ventricles are down here. The atria are up here. Here's the auricles. I always think of it as like an ear flap, right? There's the right auricle and the left, or the little flappy thingies. Now, coming off of the right ventricle, this blue thing is called the pulmonary trunk. So it has O2 poor blood, because it's blue, it's carrying blood, and it's going to separate into what are called the pulmonary arteries. So that's one, and then it splits into the left, and then back here you'll see the right pulmonary artery. So these arteries are taking blood away from the heart to the lungs. Once you get to the lungs and you oxygenate that blood, the pulmonary veins bring it back to the heart. Now notice while there's one left pulmonary artery and a right pulmonary artery, when we look at the pulmonary veins, there's always at least two on each side. So because there's two, we have to call them the superior and the inferior. So you would be saying the left superior pulmonary vein or the left inferior pulmonary vein. And then we see the aorta, the largest artery. So it starts coming off the left ventricle. It goes up, so we call that the ascending aorta, and then it curves into this arch, which is called the aortic arch. So how does blood flow through the heart? So remember, there's two circuits happening at the exact same time. So we're going to pretend to be a red blood cell and we're just gonna come in the heart and just kind of go through as a red blood cell would experience it. And then we'll actually look at how it actually beats um, and pumps at the same time. So when we have blood coming back to the heart, it's going to all be collected by the right atrium. And so this is going to be all my O2 poor blood. So anywhere above my heart is coming in my superior vena cava, 
All blood from below my heart is coming in from my inferior vena cava, and all blood from my heart is entering through a little opening on the posterior side of the heart called the coronary sinus because the heart is a muscle and it's constantly beating, so it needs to send blood back to the heart itself. So all O2 poor blood empties into the right atrium. Now, from the right atrium, it's going to flow into the right ventricle. The right ventricle is going to contract and shoot it out this pulmonary trunk, as we mentioned. So you have one pulmonary trunk, which will then split into pulmonary arteries. Now, if you look, you're going to see this structure right here. I'll use a slightly different color on this one. This thing that looks kind of like a little white ligament. Well, that's our second shunt. And so remember, the shunt's job is to not allow much blood to get to the lungs because the fetus isn't breathing. We're trying to shunt blood from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart to avoid the lungs. So this one is called the ductus arteriosus um, as a fetal shunt. And so any blood, remember two thirds of the blood goes directly over from the right side to the left side, but not all of it. So any blood that didn't get shunted is coming out that pulmonary trunk. Remember, it's trying to get to the lungs, but there's a little tube here. There's a little opening, a shunt called the ductus arteriosus, and that's going to force that blood back in the aorta to bypass the lungs. Now, after birth, it changes, it, it dissolves, it, you know, there's a little remnant of it left, but it's no longer shunting blood. We call it the ligamentum arteriosum. I know it sounds like a Harry Potter spell, but this is what we call it on our heart models. And it looks like a little white ligament, kind of. So that's the remnants of that shunt. Now, once we get into this pulmonary trunk, then it's gonna split into pulmonary arteries, right and left, and they're taking this O2 poor blood to your lungs. You're breathing. You're going to pick up oxygen and get rid of the CO2. Now we need to move that O2 rich blood back to the heart. So that will be through the pulmonary veins. Now notice that you see the pulmonary veins a little better on the posterior side. In fact, on our heart models, you actually see the left atrium really well on the posterior side. So we have superior and inferior, rights and lefts, and they're bringing blood back into the right atrium. Now, from the right atrium, that blood will flow down, let me try that again, apologize, left atrium. So it's going into the left atrium, O2 rich blood, and from there, it flows into the left ventricle. Now, the left ventricle does the most work in your heart. That has to pump really hard because it has to provide enough force to push blood in your aorta and all the way around to your big toe and back to your heart right? Because there's no pump in your big toe pumping it back up. It's pretty strong. And in fact, if you do a cut of the heart, you'll notice that the left ventricle has the thickest myocardium because that is the toughest working um, piece of the heart, right? The toughest working chamber of the heart is that left ventricle. Now, once that blood, move my head down here, okay, once that blood goes in the aorta, it's going to first go to your coronary vessels, your coronary arteries. So we're gonna have a left and right coronary artery. So they get their blood right off the aorta. Then it goes up the ascending aorta into the arch. And there's three vessels that get blood right off the aorta. They're right there. They're called the brachiocephalic trunk. That's the first one. The second one is called the left common carotid artery. And the third one is the left subclavian artery. So these are going to bring blood up to our head and neck and upper extremity. Then the aorta curves and it runs down behind the heart. This is usually called the thoracic aorta or descending aorta. Either one's fine. Once you go through the diaphragm, now you're in what's called the abdominal aorta. And you'll see this huge aorta when we're looking at our models. So that finishes up the main location, anatomy, and blood flow through the heart. And in our next lecture, we'll look more at the valves and the coronary vessels. Check out this short video giving you an animation of blood flow through the heart. Blood returns from the body to the heart via the superior and inferior vena cavae. It first enters into the right atrium, then through the tricuspid valve and into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps the deoxygenated blood through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. 
The oxygenated blood returns back to the heart through the pulmonary vein and into the left atrium. It goes through the mitral valve and finally into the left ventricle, which is responsible for pumping the oxygenated blood through the aorta and out to the body.